Hi, everybody. So thanks for that introduction. Thanks for taking your time to watch that webcast. Unfortunately, I can't see you. So I hope that many participants are joining this presentation. Um, feel free if you have any questions during my presentation to put them in the uh, Q&A tool that Zoom provides and we will cover them at the end in a short Q&A session after my presentation. So let us just start, jump into um, basically the first chapter of my presentation today is of course a little bit about who am I, who are we and what exactly do we do. Um, Basically, you all know that real estate is the largest asset class on planet Earth. So if you put that in numbers, it's always kind of outrageous how many trillion we have there. Um, still, everybody also will know that real estate is not really the cutting edge. Um, speaking of digitization, but also kind of process quality, customer centricity, and so on and so forth. So there is room to grow. Um, when we started the fund, we saw that the global investment uh, momentum is kind of rising. Um, we are also involved in some, some of the larger exits that already happened. But still looking around early 2018, we didn't really find um, a focused venture capital fund in Europe. So we saw that there are some strategic investors um, setting up kind of innovative um, venture investment entities. Um, we saw uh, some action already with uh, kind of early stage accelerators, incubators, and similar programs, company builders. But the real funds were only present in the United States, so mainly Fifth Wall and then Metaprop. So our idea was basically to, to recreate something like that in Europe early 2018. And with a very entrepreneurial attitude, beginning of 2018, we just said, okay, screw it, let's do it. So we put together um, some private money. We, we started the entity uh, with a team um, that I will come to later on and just basically opened the door. So saying, hey, PropTex in Europe, please come to us, we can invest. So we're kind of the first, more or less first European venture fund purely um, catering for PropTex. So we of course had to decide in what we invest. So PropTech as the topic is clear, but the second question was, what kind of is the um, life cycle uh, of a startup where we invest in? And typically, you, as you know, um, you segment that in seed stage, early stage, and growth stage. And roughly speaking, uh, we are investing from late seed stage to early growth stage. So the company valuations, to give you some numbers there, um, have been between 2 million euros and 50 million euros um, pre-money when we invested. So that is currently the bracket, and I think it will stay more or less the same over the next couple of years. So um, what do we need as ingredients to be a good investor for PropTex? Um, we said it all starts with the team, of course, and so um, coming also back to myself a little bit, um, Anja Rath and myself, we're the managing partners of the structure, and together with Andreas von Blotnitz and Jan-Henrik Büttner, we are kind of the venture guys in the team. So our background is basically founding companies, ourselves financing these companies, kind of changing the seed to the investor's side, uh, managing portfolios, setting up corporate venture. Uh, Jan also um, set up um, a large international venture platform called eVentures. Um, so we have, let's say, many, many, many case studies how um, the typical life cycle from a startup to grown up works. And hopefully we can be um, helpful um, within the portfolio, for example, helping founders um, to structure follow-on rounds, structuring M&A activities, structuring, of course, exits when, when the time's right. Um, the second ingredient, of course, is to have real estate experts in the team. And so this is where we, um, where we were very lucky to get some, 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 some excellent um, industry experts. Uh, for example, Dr. Beat Schwab, who was the CEO of Credit Suisse Real Estate, so one of the largest asset managers in Europe. And um, these guys um, help us to find um, yeah, the needs of the industry basically, also of course to open doors for the portfolio. And on top of that, we had kind of the third part of the team, um, three serial entrepreneurs that did uh, found crop tax when the term wasn't even coined. So Christopher Fichtner, for example, is a co-founder of Termondo, one of the first crop in Germany, or Christian Vollmann is one of the um, most likely best well-known serial entrepreneurs in Germany and also a very active business angel. 
So the idea is to combine these three um, kind of viewing angles from um, venture capital experts, real estate experts, and serial entrepreneurs, and to bring that together in, in a team kind of for the first time. Um, starting the idea with our own money first, beginning of 2018, led us to um, kind of a market test. And uh, end of 2018, we started to talk to the broader real estate ecosystem, mainly in the German speaking markets first, but then France and UK later on, to find if there are kind of incumbent real estate companies that want to join um, our mission. And we found um, a growing set of so-called LPs, so shareholders in the fund that um, invest in the fund, but also provide additional expert knowledge and also open up kind of their portfolios for our startups. So um, all shareholders in the fund so currently something like 30 and the number will go up um, uh, early next year um, are active in the real estate ecosystem. So no traditional financial investors and not of course everybody can add value to every startup we have in the portfolio but there is a quite high likeliness that there is a match. Um, so we can provide smart money for the portfolio. Still very important to remember, we are a pure financial investor. So there are no strings attached. We're not a corporate VC. Um, nobody from this page has a say in our investment decision. So uh, we're completely independent. And with that structure, we aggregate deal flow from um, all across Europe, um, starting with Germany, then Switzerland, uh, opening a small office in London this year and most likely Scandinavia next year. And that basically leads us to our own data set, um, which may be, maybe is interesting for you and we regularly are publishing that. So currently our deal flow statistics um, comprise something like 400 deals um, that we um, put in the filter and we made eight investments out of that until today. And um, you see in the donuts there where the deals are coming from, from which sub-segments they're coming, so for example, for us, construction tech is kind of still considered a part of prop tech. Um, and we are covering basically everything across the full value chain of real estate innovation. Very importantly, we want to be helpful to the founders. So hopefully uh, some of the founders will give good statements about us. And at the end of the day, therefore building kind of the best deal flow, doing the best selection, doing the best post investment support. So, Coming to the second chapter, what is kind of our view on the market right now, end of 2019? Um, if you've been to an event, uh, to a conference this year, you will have heard questions like that. Is the prop tech hype over? And of course, everybody is using the example of WeWork these days. Um, so, and of course, it's, it's very kind of spectacular yeah, to go from whatever, a 50 billion valuation down to maybe insolvency yeah, within just some weeks. And so the question is that you hear also as a prop tech investor, but also of course as a founder or kind of market participant, is it now time to panic? And is there a hype? Has the bubble been burst? Yeah? Were there extreme um, exaggerated expectations that, that cannot be met? And I think that's exactly what you have to look at to understand the dynamics uh, what are happening there and also to understand if it's time to panic or if that's just the usual thing that happens when an industry starts to get disrupted or being digitized and um, so uh, the good old Gartner hype cycle helps to understand that and I think it's more or less the perfect example if you just put in um, the pre-IPO story of we work aiming for 47 billion valuation and just literally weeks afterwards or days afterwards you were something like 10 billion even with the insolvency rumors around and even only just some weeks later on uh, uh, kind of there was already like a positive story again in the news because if we were fails who else is uh, taking kind of their market position um, so as always the first hype cycle kind of is the steepest uh, in any industry so uh, it's dangerous yeah, if you're investing on these extreme exaggerated, exaggerated expectations. But if you do your math, if you do your homework, you will understand that WeWork is not a tech startup. And so investing in that exaggerated valuation is just a bad idea. 
So that brings us to the question if we were basically is even a prop tech or all the mind spaces and regos and whatever. And according to our definition, you could say, yeah, they are doing something innovative around um, real estate. But if you look closer, how the scalability of a WeWork play is, we wouldn't agree that it's really a prop tech because we are an investor. So at the end of the day, we want to earn money and we want to earn something around 30 to 40% uh, per annum return uh, on a per project basis. So, so that is steep, that is really high. Um, if you're doing a traditional real estate investment, maybe you earn whatever, five, six, seven percent. Um, if you're doing something innovative like a WeWork, maybe you can go to something like a 10% range, but to go to 30 to 40% per year, um, that needs a really scalable idea, that needs a really scalable, usually technology-based concept um, that can grow at a rate that it's really sufficient to, um, to get near that mark. And so this is basically how we look at the market. For us, a prop check that we can invest in must be in the right area, must be 30 to 40% plus. So therefore we never invested um, in a co-working or also not a co-living operator. So um, moving on um, a little bit to what we currently see as a bigger picture in the market. And we are also um, just now finishing a research report that you can download um, early next year um, on our website, so it's free. So you can already register on the website uh, to get all these updates from our research. And the idea behind that is basically that when we started PropTech 1, it was difficult for us to find um, complete market data um, for PropTechs in Europe. It's getting better. So there are different data providers out there that are, that are starting to cover that sector, but still um, data quality is so-so. Um, and so we just tried to aggregate everything that we find and distill it out a little bit. And so that will be published early next year. And so I give you a little bit of preview here. Um, so if you look at the total prop tech funding in Europe that we found, um, you see that we are somewhere near 360 a million euros in, in 2018. And uh, we are somewhere at whatever, let's say eight-ish deals that are happening. Um, already you see that down there, we put a small asterisk. You have to take out some transactions because if somebody, according to our, our understanding, is giving a 1 billion, maybe mezzanine, maybe loan to, to um, a co working or co-living or whatever living as a service provider that according to our understanding maybe is not really a venture capital investment uh, that's maybe more a real estate investment or real estate version to investment so we took it out because it would be completely uh, blow up the scale um, but even if you take these super deals out you see that there is kind of a steady growth so that looks healthy it doesn't really look like like there is a hype cycle and we're going down again. And we're also pretty sure that 2019 numbers that we're currently aggregating will, will um, show that trend again. If you now try to put it on a map and discuss a little bit, so where is funding happening in Europe currently? Um, you see a very typical picture uh, because if you just compare that to um, segments where um, venture capital investments already happened like five, five or 10 years ago, you always see similar patterns. For example, you see that the number of deals between the German speaking market and UK is not so far away, but UK has something like a double amount of funding compared to the German speaking markets. So the individual funding rounds are larger in UK. And if we would compare that to the United States, uh, we would see again, a similar picture. So the funding rounds there are even larger. But, but you see roughly that the main markets in a way are German speaking markets, UK and Nordics, which exactly is the reason behind why we're also trying to cover these markets in our research. If you now again, try to be a little bit more precise, you will again, go back to the different stages and analyze the data according to what is seed funding, what is early stage funding and what is gross or late stage funding. And if you put that down in the diagram, you see that the late stage um, kind of funding market is just in the very beginning. So the asset class of prop techs is still pretty young. Uh, so that of course also um, 
is a very interesting thing. It's, it's not, not a big surprise, but that definitely means that if you're setting up a venture capital fund, of course, you have to focus on early stage or seed plus early plus a little bit of late. If you just do late, your investment universe will be um, maybe too small yeah, for a dedicated fund. Um, of course, the late stage rounds are larger than the early stage rounds. So if you do the diagram, not by just counting the number of rounds, but by the money invested, you see that late stage is growing and the trend will go on. So of course we will see in the next couple of years, more mature prop techs in Europe. And so the late stage numbers or the percentage will go up. What we also analyzed and we'll do different lists in these research is for example, what are largest funding rounds that we found. And uh, no surprise, the broker tax segment is still in the lead there. Yeah? Because according to our understanding, broker tech pretty much was the first sub-segment of prop tech that uh, really got significant funding in Europe. For example, in Germany, we had a regulatory change that fueled the development of companies like McMakla. Um, so um, that was kind of uh, a starting point there. But we also see, for example, Expovo in that list now, so um, a crowdfunding um, solution. So there are other segments also catching up. So coming back to the question that I had as an opening statement for this chapter, so is the hype over? Um, we definitely don't think so. For us, it's just the beginning. So we're now getting in, in the a little bit the second stage, a little bit the more mature stage. So um, everybody who's participating in the market is well advised um, to be careful to not tap into these exaggerated expectations and have a more long-term view. And we still have some, some things to do as an industry. So this is taken out of the Ernst & Young uh, research report that was published recently. And so it's interesting to see how much of the total turnover um, real estate incumbent companies put in R&D activities or in digitization activities. And if you just compare that to other industries, for example, a, a digitization change leader and winner um, in Europe is Axel Springer. And Axel Springer is, for example, investing something like almost 20% of the, of the uh, turnover into digitization activities. So you see the numbers in real estate are significantly lower. And also, if you ask decision makers and real estate companies, if they consider themselves to be kind of development phase, establishment phase, or already in digital excellence, you see that we have a meager 5 6% of people uh, saying that they're already in excellence and even more depressing in a way. So the number is going down from last year. So that's maybe the, a little bit the frustration that we feel here and there. But on the other hand, it's just a learning curve. So people now understand that it's not sufficient to just hire a, C a CIO, for example, and be digitized, uh, whatever next week. It's a change process that changes as small as everything through organization. So we definitely think there is sufficient stuff to do for the next, whatever, 10, 20 years. And so coming to last chapter, the question of course is, so what are the interesting things to watch for the next one, two, three years? And so we're also preparing a little bit of data here and, and we will publish more um, beginning of next year. So I will just briefly touch on five topics that we're currently bullish on in our team. So it doesn't necessarily mean that we're doing investments in that areas, but I think it's for obvious reasons. These are uh, interesting topics for everybody to consider. So the first thing I took out is maybe sounds a little bit like a step back. So we said produce standardized data sets, then take AI baby steps. So you will see a lot of startups um, that, that kind of coin the promise that with some magic artificial intelligence, machine learning algorithm thing, they will um, completely change the, the, the stages uh, of the industry. So they will make everything more efficient. They will make better buying or selling decisions or better operation decisions, what's wrong. The problem is, or reality is, that we are still in the first inning of digitization. So if you do a simple diagram, the first thing you have to do is to digitize individual documents. So the state of the industry in many areas is still, it's kind of a paper-based industry. So you have to literally to scan documents and then 
to get the data out of these scanned documents. So if you just have a PDF, it's more or less just a file, but you have to get the data out there. Um, then the next step, what, what is a good idea, of course, for any industry, um, is to standardize um, the data sets. So what exactly is the data set for, let's say, a digital asset? Um, so if an asset owner, it doesn't matter if it's a family office or a large fund, is selling a portfolio of property to another um, fund, do they have to start all over in kind of digitizing the asset, getting the data in, or is there a standard set of metadata, a standard kind of file structure or stuff like that? And we, we see that happening now in different areas of the industry, but again, still the starting point. Only after that, we think it really makes big sense to kind of leverage that data and to start with the fancy stuff. So only then you have the data to train a machine learning algorithm and to create additional value out of that. So in a nutshell, we're, all, we're, we're always still here. So this is why we are still very interested in uh, investing in startups that are doing the first steps, that are laying the groundwork for the things to come in the future. Um, the second thing is, you all will know that there was a little bubble maybe um, in the area of the so-called tenant experience domain. So we saw in 2017, 2018, we saw, and also 2019, we saw a lot of startups that kind of won awards for their great apps that you have on the iPhone or your Android device, which should give you kind of a new um, way, a new interface to interact with real estate. Doesn't really matter if it's commercial or if it's residential real estate. And we think that there was a little hype there. And um, so the idea was going around that, that everybody who kind of enables his, his real estate with this additional digital interface um, has whatever, happy tenants uh, and, and magic things happen. So we think that promise is difficult um, to fulfill if you're just speaking about kind of that eye candy stuff, so that user interface driven, very front end, um, front end uh, oriented stuff. But we see a lot of added value if you're going to the more nitty gritty back end process oriented things. So think about logistics, think about a shopping center, for example, where you have tons of data, tons of security systems, tons of moving parts in a way you have to manage and operate. So we really think that IoT is very strong in, for example, bringing facility management to the next level, optimizing dull tasks that currently kind of human beings are, um, are doing. Um, so this is the domain we're really interested in. So not too much fancy front end stuff, more looking into the um, B2B back end kind of a, already a, li a, a little bit deep tech um, areas there. Third topic is we think that there has been um, a, a lot of action happening in kind of B2C financing. So what do we mean with B2B financing? So you all know that um, investing in real estate as a private individual is uh, not such an easy experience. So if you really buy, want to buy physical real estate, that's a kind of a large transaction. It is kind of clumsy, it's offline and in, in, in a lot of countries you have to go to the notary and so on and so forth. And there is no real equivalent to doing that in an online way, like with a FinTech. So, and we all know that from the FinTech wave, it's easy now to have um, like ETF based robo advisors or to have fixed interest um, offerings just uh, on the website. And you can open an account over the weekend and you're ready to go. So there was kind of a fintech revolution. The question is now, is that wave coming to real estate? And a lot of um, first um, models there are kind of the crowdfunding platforms like Expo that take real estate and sell it basically to consumers in, in small checks. And that definitely is an interesting area. But if you just compare the numbers, uh, what, what the size is of traditional B2B financing, so where kind of the real music is playing, if you want to say so. We just think that the retail crowdfunding area um, is nice and it, it, it's interesting and maybe you can also earn money as an investor, but we're much more focused where the larger amount of the market is. So dull B2B loan-based financing, for example, from big bank syndicates and the pros around that. 
So this is also again an area where maybe um, a startup doesn't consider it to be very fancy or sexy, but as the market is so large and the status quo of the industry is um, really, really weak, um, we think there is lots of room to innovate. Coming to the fourth area, uh, also maybe an obvious thing, but we still think that there is a lot to do, is the industrialization of construction. So what do we mean with that? If you just visit any construction site, you will see that the process happening there is still very similar to kind of 100 years ago. So the construction site is still handled in a way like it's an individual project with individual components that get assembled on site in kind of an individual way. So of course, there are much more efficient ways to do so. So prefabrication, modular construction, but also thinking about the methodology, how you manage a construction site. Um, if you compare that, for example, to an IT project, so around uh, in the last 10, 20 years, the methodology in IT has completely changed. Think about uh, kind of agile development, scrum, Kanban boards, whatsoever. So there are endless examples. Methodology for managing a construction site is still mainly is the same like it was 100 years ago. So startups that are active in that domain can add tremendous value. Uh, because all these companies that are working there are under constant pressure to either optimize the delivery time of what they're doing or, of course, optimize cost and price. So this is something where we will see um, lots of stuff happening. And that maybe is what today now you could also say is kind of the construction tech segment that, that's getting bigger and bigger. Uh, from our perspective, construction tech, as I said before, is a sub-segment of prop tech. So that's also something that we cover. And last but not least, maybe also not a big surprise, is what we said here for the coin Greta Tech. Yeah? So of course we see a big second wave now coming of sustainability or eco-friendly um, solutions. And just one thing, because it's obvious it makes sense, but one thing to have in mind, we will see more and more legislation, legislation coming up. We will see more and more regulation coming up um, think about uh, uh, the Madrid conference right now. So unfortunately, very unfortunately, it was kind of a failure. But we see that a lot of regions across Europe, a lot of cities, a lot of smaller systems now say, we have to tackle um, the problem. We have to get uh, CO2 neutral. So what is a way to go that, uh, to go into that direction is of course to change kind of local regulation. And local regulation usually also regulates how you build a house what kind of um, heating system, what kind of insulation you have, what material you're using. And this picture here is just a simple example. So just some years ago, it was kind of impossible to build a commercial real estate building, kind of a 10 story house or even higher out of wood. Um, not because it was physically impossible, so that was not, not a big technology problem, but the regulation was not there. So authorities um, didn't have kind of the process to validate that um, in case of a fire, for example, um, uh, the building is, uh, is okay and they can kind of certify that. So the, th that has been done in a lot of countries. So the innovative companies have uh, done the difficult first um, uh, pioneer phase here and have organized that regulation now is in place. And that's just, as I said, one example out of a hundred where we will see um, more kind of technology driven companies and startups um, earning good money, but of course also generating a second return um, because it also contributes to um, CO2 uh, neutrality. And so um, we, will, we definitely think that there is kind of a second wave, if you, if you would say so, the first wave was maybe the beginning of um, renewable energy, um, something like 10, 15 years ago, and uh, the construction industry, real estate is definitely a big story of that, not just building new um, real estate, because that's just a small fragment of the market, but of course also ret retrofitting existing real estate, which is the clear majority, of course, of the market. Um, and so basically that's it for my presentation. And so we have um, something like maybe five, six minutes um, to ask some, uh, answer some questions. We already have like two questions. So if you want to put more questions in the Q&A tool, feel free to. 
Uh, maybe we have some more time. I will just, just start there. So first question here is, does the low return real estate around 5% mentioned earlier negatively impact willingness for owners to invest in solutions? I think um, the question is a little bit, um, so it's a good question, but the, the situation was over the last couple of years that it was very, very easy to also earn maybe 10% or even 15% out of traditional real estate. So for example, I'm just sitting in our Berlin office here, looking out of the window, and a lot of developers that just bought old houses, renovate them a little bit and sold them in single units again, easily made 10-15% uh, per year on these projects. That market is gone. So it's not so easy anymore to earn that crazy money in traditional real estate. And we think that's a good idea, not just because the prices are not going up so high now anymore, but because that now needs that you need to innovate. You need to make your process more efficient. So basically, um, unless we have a kind of world economic crisis that nobody wants, we even think it's a good idea that it's that's a good thing for us uh, and for kind of the uh, digitization um, movement um, that it's not so easy anymore to earn that crazy money like it was the last 10, 20 years. Um, do you have an opinion of which your trends will see the most activity in 2020? So that, that's a difficult one. Um, we as a fund are not focusing on just one topic. So we cover everything across the whole value chain. And so therefore we don't want to uh, put all our eggs in one basket. So there will always be diversification and therefore we are kind of neutral on that. So we, 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 will, we always have several things that we're watching. And also um, to be completely open, of course, it's also a kind of opportunistic situation. So it doesn't make sense that we sit together in a chamber and say, this is the topic for next year. And then we don't find deal flow in that domain. So of course, we're always open to uh, clever founders um, uh, calling us up, sending us the pitch decks. We will take a look, even if that's a topic that we didn't consider as hot for 2020. So there's always also an opportunistic side to that. Uh, technical question, can we receive the presentation? I guess so. So I can put it on a slideshare um, afterwards. And is PropTech investing in PropTech solutions from Eastern Europe? Yes, we are. So um, Europe is, is our investment universe. Eastern Europe, definitely a part of that. Um, of course, uh, we're always interested in solutions that have kind of an international perspective or at least, let's say, in a European market first, but then maybe international potential beyond that. But uh, we're absolutely free to invest across Europe. Um, Last question I have here, what might be the convenient trends in prop tech and third party countries? How it may attract investors and startups to do activities in those geographical areas? Um, I'm not sure if I got the question right. So third party countries, maybe you mean third world countries or, or emerging markets. Um, I'm not so sure about that. So, so what, what the background of the question is how it may it attract investors and startups to do it is in those geographic areas. So if, you, if you're thinking about emerging markets, maybe that's the background of your question. So I know that, for example, some of our LPs are very keen now to, for example, um, do modern real estate development in India, because this is, for example, a market where um, you have massive um, room to grow for all kinds of infrastructure. And um, so just anecdotally, you will know uh, a lot of bad news stories where um, buildings are kind of um, are on fire and break down, et cetera, because just the build and the electricity um, quality there is very weak. So there is, of course, a lot of room to, to export in a way good ideas. Uh, also, by the way, um, so that's, that's also a good thing. So we see a lot of trends coming out of Europe. So for example, the German um, regulation on, on building quality in a way is, is very strict, it's very high. So if you can do something here, you kind of have the gold standard internationally and you can easily export that. So um, we also believe that in prop tech and construction tech, it's not like in other asset classes that you um, always have to look to Silicon Valley and then kind of export these ideas worldwide. We also believe that a lot of new things come out of Europe with international um, potential. Um, ah, okay, so the, the explanation is that the country uh, or the region referring to something like Ukraine or uh, Belarus. Um, so of course, there is tremendous um, 
um, potential to to kind of jump to the next stage. Yeah, speaking of basically infrastructure, so so definitely that's that's an interesting topic. Um, so as I said before, so there's also always the market of new real estate where, where new buildings are constructed and you can put in fancy things there, but the market for retrofit is much larger kind of in any country. Um, so that, that's why we're always very keen also to look at solutions that, for example, increase energy efficiency of existing buildings with uh, yeah, as little entry barriers um, you can have in that segments. So I think if we don't have any more questions um, from your side, then I think we can call it a day. So um, thanks a lot for watching and uh, we will put the presentation online and yeah, not forget. So if, if you're interested to get the research updates from us, just register on the website, it's free. And then you will also get early next year, the report on the uh, European CropTech ecosystem. Bye-bye. Thank you.